Hello and welcome. Happy Easter. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Jason, one of the pastors on staff, and I am so glad you've decided to come worship with us today. I just want to let you know, if you're a visitor with us, please stop by our Welcome Center. It's at the end of the, end of the lobby by the big screen. We have a gift for you, and we'd also uh, just love to answer any questions that you might have. One of the best ways to get engaged in the life of this church is through a class called Basics. And that's a class that we offer almost every weekend out of the year. And for a little bit more about that, watch the video. Hi, welcome to Northeast. We're so happy you joined us today. We've got a lot of great things happening in our church, but with so much to keep track of, you might have a few questions, such as, how do I volunteer? How do I find community? What is a stakeholder? I mean, doesn't that guy burn his hands? Are Blitz Days all about football? Is that why you have a playbook? How many light bulbs fit into the Jesus' Y wall? What's the deal with all the semesters, at, or trimesters, third trimester, is that right? Which one's Corbin? Which one's Trevor? Are there memberships? How do I get connected? There's puppets? Why are there pillows on the floor? Where do I park? What is a scribe tribe? How do I solve this? Where's Walden Street? Group Connect? Tell you what, why don't we just start with the basics? Northeast Basics is a four-week course that meets during the 11 o'clock service, and we guarantee that all your questions will be answered. Even this one. Sign up for Northeast Basics today. Hello, welcome to Northeast. We are so glad that you've decided to come worship with us today to celebrate Easter. As Jesus died for our sin, and three days later rose again. And as you walked on our campus, I hope that you felt the love of God. This is the Love the Ville Church, and we want to unleash Jesus' love every day, everybody, everywhere. So we hope that you felt that as you came on today. Uh, if you didn't get communion when you came in, it's right on the outside of the doors. We're going to take communion later on in the service together. And we're going to get started. So if you can hear my voice in the lobby, now would be the time to come in because you want to have your seat when we get started. And we're starting in T-minus one minute.
sing with us. Yeah. 
the way to get started. I don't know what is. Uh, we are so glad that you are <clears throat> here with us today. And welcome to those who are watching online. Miss Kitty, hello. I know you're out there. Thanks for joining us today. We are the Love the Ville Church. And we want to unleash the love of Jesus every day, everybody, everywhere in our home, work, city, church, school. And we encourage every single person that calls this home to live that lifestyle. And so maybe you're here because one of those folks invited you. And that's because they love you. And we want to love our city. We want to unleash his love every day. One of the ways we do that is through partnerships. Uh, every Christmas, we take up an offering that funds our Love the Ville outreach for the next year. And this past Christmas, we took up over $2 million. Isn't that awesome? And those are funds that don't stay here. They go outside of these walls for the peace and prosperity of our city in our world. And so today on this Easter, we get to celebrate two very special gifts that we're going to make to two really important partners. One of those is Never Thirst. Never Thirst brings clean water and the living water of Jesus to unreached people groups all over this world. Uh, Tamara and some folks from our church got to go visit uh, a place in Ethiopia just a few weeks ago to see how Never Thirst will go into a town and they'll plant a church. And then that church will dig a well and they'll teach them sanitation, they'll teach them upkeep. And it's amazing how access to that clean water changes a community and changes lives. I'll never forget the story of Musa. Musa is a pastor in one of these towns where Christianity was previously not welcome, not accepted, not allowed. And as he was giving a tour to the Never Thirst people, he was surrounded by an imam and people from the mosque and he's preaching the gospel. And somebody says, why do you let him speak about Jesus? And they said, he brought the water. He could say whatever he wants. We are so excited because one of those villages that Tamara and the team visited, the week before, they baptized 50 people in clean water. We started working with Never Thirst in Uganda and now in Ethiopia, and we are giving them $60,000 so that that happens again and again and again. That's awesome, church. Around the world and in our own backyard, there is great need. 
there is great need. And one of the most pressing needs we see right now is to end the scourge of human trafficking. It's hard to believe that this is even happening the way it is, but you can't turn on the TV without seeing a story about it these days. Did you know that over the last few years, the victims reporting of human trafficking have been up over 71% in the last three years? In our state's not immune. Did you know that Kentucky is ninth in the country in new reports? And the Kentucky Derby, our beloved Derby that we're so proud of, is one of the largest events in the world where human trafficking occurs. And so we were resolved to do something about this with our brand new partner, Refuge for Women. Refuge makes it their goal to end human trafficking one woman at a time. This is some video of the house that they have in Lexington where they bring women in for their safety and for their nourishing, for their saving, and like they just really changed their lives in this place. And we're so excited with this, with this brand new partnership that Northeast is giving them $100,000 to kick it off and build the first of its kind house in Louisville. It should be done by the end of this year, and we can't wait to see how God moves and changes so many lives. And so church, if you gave to that Love the Ville offering, Man, praise God, because you're a part of this. And if you've just come in today and you're hearing it for the very first time, we want you to know that you can, you can be involved too. You can give online, you can give in the boxes out in the lobby, and every time you do, you help us to unleash the love of Jesus. And if you are for the peace and prosperity of your city, if you want the Bill to be the best it can be, join us. Join us. God is doing some great things here and around the world. So thank you for being a part of it. I want to pray for those partners. I want to uh, welcome to the stage Melissa Wallace. Melissa is one of the big folks over at Refuge for Women. Can we welcome her to the stage? We're so thankful for what you all are doing. Development director, is that what you do? For? Okay. Let's, let's go ahead and pray for Melissa and pray for Refuge, pray for Never Thirst. Dear God, we thank you for Melissa and what her team are doing in the lives of so many women, that they're changing the trajectory uh, of every, everything in their life, God. And we just pray for peace there. We pray for them to get connected to the right people, that they can find hope and freedom through refuge. Lord, we pray for uh, supernatural protection over their, over their area, over that house. Lord, make that path straight to get that house together quickly. Lord, we thank you for what they're going to do, and we praise you ahead of time for the lives that are going to be changed. And Lord, we thank you for Never Thirst on the other side of the world where they're bringing your gospel, and they're bringing the, the most necessary things for life. And Lord, we pray for protection for them. We pray that your gospel is shared boldly, and we pray that people who have never heard your name uh, learn to follow you and learn to know your salvation. Thank you, God, for being so good. We thank you for these partners, and we pray that this money is multiplied and used in such a powerful way. You are so good. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Melissa. Can we thank her one more time? Well, folks, we get a great pleasure today as we get to see someone give their life to Jesus in baptism. So watch as Mona gives her life to Jesus. Good morning, Northeast. Happy Easter. It is my profound, profound honor to introduce my beautiful wife, Mona. Mona has an interesting faith walk, actually an awesome faith walk. Born and raised Roman Catholic, somehow, as only my wife can do, she found her way into an all-black church at 18 years of age in Portland, Oregon, and accepted Jesus as her savior. And I can attest, having been around her for 25 years, that Jesus has been the center, the core, and the foundation of her life. Recently, she's expressed a desire to be able to, ex to exemplify what was taking place internally, externally, and what better way to do that than to get baptized on Easter. So, Mona, please repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept him. And I accept him as my Lord and as Savior. As my Lord and Savior. 
Upon that good confession, upon that good confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Nothing like celebrating new life on Easter in the baptistry and nothing like celebrating new life on Easter by giving some of our Love the Ville monies away to such great organizations. If you don't know us here at the Love the Ville Church, we think there's no better way to celebrate resurrection life than to do that, to celebrate it with generosity. And so uh, if, if you hear or understand anything about us today, at the center of our heart, that's who we are. We believe cross-shaped love leads to resurrection life. Now, uh, there's this ancient tradition that Christians have been doing for centuries now. Some believe it goes back to the days, the months, immediately after Jesus' resurrection. An early relic of the earliest church. Because of their great astonishment, that Jesus was alive. Christians began to greet one another with these words. They would say, he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. And indeed, he is. And indeed, every single year on Easter, there are some professional Christians in the room who are ready for the moment. Y'all understand the assignment? You're like, he's risen indeed. Now, while these words are simple and beautiful, several years ago, we acknowledged as a church that, well, that just ain't how we talk here in Kentucky, y'all. Definitely not in Oldham County. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't say indeed around these parts, is what I'm trying to say. So, uh, a few years ago, we took some artistic liberties and we decided to update this phrase so that it could fit a little bit more with our Kentucky culture and we could proudly and authentically pass it down to our children and our children's children. Are you ready to participate with me in the kentucky version of this? Uh, let's do it. He gone. Yeah. He gone. Yeah. I said he gone. Yeah. And indeed, he gone. All right. <laughs> you know, uh, I was thinking about this week, some of y'all only join us on Easter, which is, we're glad to have you on Easter, um, but you hear this every year, you're like, he gone, these people are idiots, I get it, you're like, really, he gone, really, pastor, really, and I would just encourage you, come back next week when we aren't on our best behavior, <laughs> then you're going to see something, uh, somebody told me a few weeks ago, they're like, okay, he gone, you're going to do that, but what you need to do, Tyler, is you need to come up with a version for the youths. There's so many youths that are in our service. We love the youths here. So um, I've worked on this really, really hard, put a lot of time and prayer into this over the last three weeks. I've come up with a youths version for us. You ready? Can you participate in this with me? He is risen. I don't even know what that means. So I don't know why you're laughing. I hope it's because it's actually funny and not a pejorative or something. Anyways. Now, my question is this. What has given this statement, he has risen, such longevity? Well, I believe it's because for Christians, it's our answer to the reality of death. You know, we all got to reckon with death eventually. Maybe you're young and you haven't really thought about the fact that one day you will die. Maybe you've had a near-death experience. Maybe death is knocking on your door right now. Either way, it must be reckoned with. You know, if I'm being totally honest with you, uh, my, my number one spiritual struggle right now in life has been reckoning with the reality of my own mortality. 
I don't know why I've thought about it more in the last year than really ever before. So I'm, you're gonna laugh. I'm, I'm 37 years old. I know a, a few of you are maybe a little older than that. Uh, but the U.S. Uh, life expectancy uh, for, for men is 73.5 years, so you can do the math. By the numbers, I have lived more days than what I have left. And that's just strange to think about. The other day I was driving down Brownsboro here and we passed the cemetery. And I remember my wife was there, she was talking and, and I was just like, hey, uh, where are we gonna get buried? And she was like, whoa, <laughs> it's a hard right. I mean, we were talking about the grocery list. We're gonna go there, okay. Um, and I don't expect her to understand. She's young, she's 36. Uh, so <laughs> one day she'll start thinking about mature matters like that. But, but is this what a midlife crisis is? I mean, I don't know. We all must reckon with death. And in the grips of death, what I love about today is that we Christians can cry out, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And it reminds us of everything that we believe. What is it that we believe? Well, uh, we believe we all will die, no doubt. And why? Because the wages of sin is death. But we also believe that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins and sin and death could not keep him down. And so sin and death will not keep us down either. So next slide here, perhaps today, perhaps we should change the, the saying around a bit. And today we should, we should say it like this. He is risen and so shall we be. Hmm. Now in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is actually trying to explain all this. I believe it's one of the densest chapters on resurrection in all of the scriptures. And, uh, in this chapter, Paul says that resurrection is basically a non-negotiable, either all in or all out. Like if Jesus was risen from the dead, then he is him and you gotta go all in. Everybody falls at his feet. If he didn't rise from the dead though, well, actually uh, Paul suggests for us, he's just for us a different phrase that we might use if Jesus wasn't risen from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, 32, Paul writes this. He says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Now let's let, try that one. Uh, on this Easter. You ready? <clears throat> Let us eat and drink. Let us eat and drink. I said, let us eat and drink. Bet you didn't think you'd be chanting that at Easter. But I wanted you to say it because, well, this is how our culture, which thinks that God and, and resurrection are glorified superstitions. Uh, this is how our culture equips us to face death. Perhaps you would allow me to translate that one into 21st century terms. Our culture tells us to medicate the meaninglessness and make the most of the moment. In the face of death, these are our cultural maxims. Medicate the meaninglessness and make the most of the moment while you still can. And there's a lot of meaninglessness if there is no God. If there's no God, then, then 14 billion years ago, there was an explosion that created us. No intelligent designing force behind it. It was just a chaotic random explosion that created us. Think about that. Chaos plus entropy equals order and complexity. What an incredibly unscientific founding assumption. Who banged the bang? Where did the little supercharged ball of matter or light come from that started it all? We don't know. But what we do know, what we do know is that you are not a snowflake. You are just math. The energy, doesn't, uh, the energy of the universe doesn't have this sort of destiny for you that it's guiding you magically to. You, you don't matter. You just matter. You've seen the, the shirts, right? Like, so uh, there's a bunch of shirts going around. Even through, I think we got a picture of one where like, people are like, you're, you're worthy, you're loved, you're needed. You're Actually, I've noticed this recently. They started putting this on the back of the shirt. And it's like a message to the person behind you. It's the Starbucks like, hey, person behind me in line, you are beautiful and you're worthy and you're loved and you look like a good friend and I need a friend. That's why I'm wearing this shirt. So would you be my friend? Here's my number. You know, like people who wear that shirt want to talk. You don't wear a shirt like, I, I will never wear that shirt. But like people, anyway, so uh, 
I just always think when people are wearing the You Matter shirt, I'm like, you better believe in God. Because if you don't, I got a better shirt for you. Science says you matter until you multiply yourself times the speed of light squared. Then you energy. <laughs> Some of y'all ain't laughing. This is okay. I, you, I understand why you don't get it. It's okay. Ask your friend. But isn't this one of the deep longings of the human heart? To matter. We think to ourselves, is my life important in any way? Do I matter to anyone? Well, if you believe there's no God, then we're all here basically by luck. And life is the acquisition of wounds from people and time until you die. And then when you die, it's like unplugging a lamp, just off. So what do we do in the face of that? Well, we medicate the meaninglessness. What's your medication of choice? Is it a little too much bourbon a little too often? Is it one, two, four glasses of wine every night so that you can get yourself to sleep? Do you bend sugar every day at the end of the day? Is it prescription meds or maybe something worse? Is it online gaming or online gambling or online shopping, AKA retail therapy? <laughs> it, isn't it funny how we call uh, uh, greed therapy? <laughs> hmm. Speaking of greed, maybe it's uh, spending all that money you make on lavish vacations or experiences, or maybe it's just the work. Like you like the work, you like to make the money, you wanna leave a mark on your industry, that's your medication of choice. I, I don't know what it is for you. It's probably some combination of some of those plus screens. For all of us though, there's the plus screens because we just kind of scroll it away. Netflix, yeah. sports, whatever it is. Glued to a screen. Did you see this? Uh, I saw this past week that Florida is trying to pass a ban on social media for young people. Kids under the age of 14 wouldn't be able to create uh, accounts. Uh, 14 and 15 year olds would have to get uh, permission from parents, parental consent to have an account. Um, and... Uh, I found this fascinating. I mean, you know how I feel. If you come around here a lot, this is kind of a hobby horse for me. Are you gonna talk about screens every week, Tyler? Yes. Because the amount of hours we spend on them is stunning. It's stunning. And they're not good for us, at least not in large doses. They're basically like pacifiers for adults. People come up to me often, they're like, Tyler, you're, just, you're hard on us with the screen. Just, just chill. I just, I'm just coming home, I'm just scrolling. That's it, I'm just scrolling. I'm just watching The Office for the seventh time. I just, just need to relax, it's harmless. I wanna turn my brain off at the end of the day. Uh, when people say that, I'm like, okay, well, first off, not harmless, the science is in, it's not harmless, but that's another sermon. Um, second off, did you hear what you just said? You wanna turn your brain off? Is that how life-sucking our existence has become? That at the end of the day, we just wanna turn, by the way, God has given us a healthy way to turn our brains off, did you know? Yeah, it's called sleep, thank you. <laughs> From the mouth of children. <laughs> you should try it. You know, uh, from the conversations that I'm having, a lot of people ain't getting enough of it. You know that person that comes into work every morning like, oh, I'm so tired. And, and, and you're like, I'm so sorry. But then you get on Instagram and you get into your inbox and you got 17 reels from them after midnight. It's like, I don't feel sorry for you anymore. Uh, the US, uh, or excuse me, the World Happiness Report got published recently. Did you see this? I'm pretty sure they publish one every year. And this year, the results are not good for us. It says that the US is no longer one of the top 20 happiest countries in the world. Uh, in a gaping disparity, Americans over 60 are some of the world's happiest while those under 30 are among the most miserable in the developed world. And that breaks my heart, but I also think like, how? We're living in America, how? Elon's got us in self-driving, bulletproof cyber trucks. Coke Zero tastes better than Coke and has no sugar, which means it's healthy, maybe, probably not. Uh, 
And, and we don't even have to experience reality through our own eyes anymore because Zuckerberg's got meta goggles getting us one step closer to the matrix. Look at the picture, y'all. That's the matrix. <laughs> it's 2024. What a time to be alive. Why are we so sad? Why are we turning brains off in advanced America? Well, I'll tell you why. This is what I believe. I believe we're sad because we're medicating the meaninglessness uh, with screens and substances and sciences, which, which aren't necessarily bad things. A lot of times they're good things, but we're treating them like ultimate things. And what we find out quickly is that, well, these things do very little to help us cope with the reality that we are hurtling toward nothingness if there is no God. One day the world is gonna burn up because of global warming or you know, one of the world superpowers is gonna fire off space nukes and one thing will lead to another and then it's the end. And no one remembers anything we ever did. By the way, this is my first problem with placing our hope in human progress, which is what we do in progressive societies. When I say progressive, I'm not using it in a political sense. It's not a political statement. It's more or less about our society and where we find our hope or our salvation. And in our society, it's in human ingenuity. We want to leave the world a little bit of a better place for the folks who come after us. But you know what I found? When we place our hope in, in human progress, there's actually, there's actually no real future in it. It's so focused on the future, but there's no real future in it. There's no final resting place where we get to utopia and everything's okay. There's no heaven. There's no reunion with, with loved ones. Uh, then there's no justice. Have you ever thought about this? There's actually no final justice. We live in a world right now that is incredibly aware of historic injustices, which I think is a good thing. As a Love the Ville church, as people of Shalom, uh, we should see injustice and want to root it out with the justice of God, no doubt. But part of the problem with believing that this is all there is, is that it's kind of sickening to think that the villains of history are just going to get away with it. They're going to get away with it. There's nothing you can do about it. All the tyrants and dictators and despots of the past, don't know if you know this, but they did. So you can tear down their statues all you want to. They don't care. They did. You can say whatever you want to about them in a history class. They don't care. They're dead. And one day human history will cease to exist anyways and all memory of them will be gone. So they win. They had a pretty good life, by the way, when they were here. Better than most of ours by the standards that we measure a good life. They had power, wealth, fame, access, autonomy, and pleasure beyond what you could have ever imagined. And they got it all by bullying the weak leaving human casualties in their wake, using human beings as pawns in their game. And despite all that violence, despite all that evil, they lived lives of luxury and adrenaline. And they're gonna get away with it. No eternal judgment, no final justice. Nah, 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 they dead, don't matter. Now, if you're like me, something inside of you thinks, no! That's not right. There's something inside of us that, that wants to see the world set right and justice meted out someday. And I would suggest to you that this longing for justice in the human heart, it's not fake, it's prophetic. It begs to be filled, satisfied, and one day it will. But only if, only if he is risen. He is risen indeed. Now back to Paul, uh, the other strategy that we use to distract ourselves from death is making the most of the moment. Medicate the meaninglessness and then make the most of the moment. In our achievement oriented society, well, uh, you basically are what you do, what you accomplish. It's this race against the death clock to get as much done as you possibly can and make your mark before time runs out. Because that's how you prove you lived a worthy life. You know, when we're young and, and not jaded yet, sometimes we really actually believe, like, I can make a difference in this world. That's what you're told over and over. You can be whatever you want. You can make a difference. You're a world changer. Every commencement address, right? So you graduate college at 22 and you're like, I got 1,300 followers on Instagram and a college degree. I'm going to change the world. You know the song uh, in, in Hamilton where it's like, a, history has its eyes on you. You know what I'm talking about? 
We go to Hamilton and we're like, uh, it's about me. History has its eyes on me. It's talking about George Washington, Alexander Hamilton. You know, they kind of like did the whole American Revolution thing, started a, a country, pretty good one, uh, America. History has eyes on this. So it would you, like, it's about me. And as you grow up, all of a sudden you realize, well, maybe I'm not George Washington. Maybe I'm not gonna make that, that sort of impact on the world. So the footprint sh shrinks a little bit. And you say, well, you know, but what I will do is I'll make an impact on my industry. And so you throw yourself into work. But then you watch as one CEO retires and is like forgotten in a month. Or you watch as the top seller shifts companies and is replaced in a week. And you're like, oh, maybe this isn't as important as I thought. So you say, but you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll make a mark on my kids. That's, that's who I'll leave my legacy with. I'll, I'll, I'll make a mark on them. And make a mark on your kids you did. Poor kids. <laughs> did you give them any of your good qualities? Is my question. No, kids, we love you. And we're sorry. <laughs> we're sorry ahead of time for screwing you up in whatever ways that we did. Now, I'm not trying to be cynical here. I'm really not. I just wanna be realistic. There's probably not anybody in this room that will be remembered 100, 150 years after you die. And yet, there is a desire in the human heart, everyone in this room, to last beyond the boundaries of life, isn't there? And I would suggest to you that that desire is not fake, it's prophetic. It begs to be filled, and one day it will be filled, it will be satisfied, but only if he is risen. He is risen indeed. You know, uh, the frontiers of medical research are obsessed right now with extending life beyond the bound. Finding that holy grail, you know, Indiana Jones, this is the frontiers of medical research. They want to expand our lifespan, but they also want to expand our health span as well, which is fantastic, right on. Basically, what they're trying to do is, is they're trying to figure out how was Brady still winning rings in his 40s? <laughs> How is LeBron at the age of 39 still a top five player in, in the NBA? How? How? And what they want to do is they take that, put it in a bottle, manufacture it to the masses, and they'll be rich. Feel like you're in your 20s when you're actually in your 50s? I mean, they'll, they'll be rich. So you know the drill. Kelp is the new kale. Take your probiotics. Put a little collagen in your coffee and get an ice barrel for your backyard for a little at-home cryotherapy. <laughs> you laughed. Did anybody else get spammed on the gram by the ice barrel? It's the only ad I see, I swear. So, hey, okay, sidebar here. This is not, it has nothing to do with Easter. Uh, I think that, it, if, as if they need it, but I think Instagram could open up for themselves an entire new stream of revenue if they would take the algorithms they have on all of us and repackage them as personality inventories. Goodbye, Strengths Finder. Goodbye, Enneagram. Goodbye, Disc. Try this today. Go, go to Easter brunch. Everybody open the gram and then pass your phone to the person to your right. And like all they got to do is look at your suggesteds and look at the ads that are hitting you. They'll tell you everything they need to know about you. Okay, and the gram was after me on the cryotherapy. You know, for one meager house payment, you can have a glorified trash can to put ice anyway. So um, <laughs> now we laugh, but people are cryo-freezing their bodies right now in liquid nitrogen after they die, hoping that 100 years from now, technology will crack the code and bring them back. Have you seen this? So this is a picture of C former CEO of Alcor, Max Moore, uh, who is posing in front of a bunch of little ice tombs or tubes, however you want to say it with frozen dead people in them. Uh, as of October 31st, Alcor had 222 frozen people and 33 frozen pets. You gasp at the pets. I seen how you let your dog like lick peanut butter out of your mouth, sleep in the same bed. I ain't even trying to hear it. People, oh, pets. You know what I didn't see in the article was any mention of spouses being frozen with them, okay? But that's another, <laughs> we'll do that sermon series later. Uh, okay, so look, progressive societies, again, progressive societies that place their hope in human ingenuity. 
I think they're just destined to be disappointed constantly. Uh, the last two centuries, we've had some pretty incredible evidence here. Uh, the 20th century in and of itself, we saw advancements in medical science and technology like people in the early 1900s could have never imagined. They couldn't imagine the world we're living in right now, could they? What an incredible century. And yet, it was one of the most tragic, bloodiest centuries in the history of the planet Earth. The most educated and cultured country on the planet pulled off the Holocaust. You got a couple world wars, the Great Depression, the Cold War, Mao, Pol Pot, Stalin, Hitler, all in about an 80 year span. It's a lot of blood. So see, this brings me to my second problem with hoping in human progress. What I have found reading the history books is that humans are capable of great evil no matter how advanced we get. Advancing technology does not necessarily mean advancing morality. Technology can stimulate struggling economies, praise God, or it can create nuclear weapons. Technology uh, in medical science can cure diseases, praise God. It can also be exploited by pharmaceutical companies. You see? Now, it's interesting. After the Cold War, we had a couple of decades there at the end of the 1900s that went pretty good. Beginning of the you know, 2000s went pretty good. And so we started to believe in this myth of human progress and hope in human progress once again. This hope was summed up by, uh, by Israeli historian Yuval Harara's uh, uh, best-selling book that he published in 2017 called Homo Deus. In the book, he makes the argument that in ancient times, human beings needed gods because we couldn't control stuff. No, 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 we understand how things work. But now, with the advancing science and technology and everything, we don't need the gods anymore because we can control things. This is what he says. Uh, again, this is written in 2017. He said, at the dawn of the third millennium, humanity wakes up to an amazing realization. Most people rarely think about it, but in the last few decades, we have managed to rein in famine, plague, and war. We don't need to pray to any god or saint to rescue us from them. We know quite well what needs to be done in order to prevent famine, plague, and war, and we usually succeed in doing it. Now, I want to point out again, this was written in 2017, and uh, 2020 then came along and said, you've all hold my beer. And it was a disaster on so many levels. Race war, political war, an attack on the Capitol. It feels like there's mass shootings almost every week anymore. COVID-19, remember that one? To date, over 7 million COVID-induced deaths. There's a, there's a war between Russia and Ukraine, which threatens to draw the world in. There's a war between Palestine and Israel, which threatens to draw the world in. North Korea has hypersonic warheads now. And oh, by the way, the UN World Food Program says that we are currently facing the worst food crisis in modern history. So let me read to you Mr. Harara's statement again. He said, we know what needs to be done to prevent famine, plague, and war, and we usually succeed in doing it. Hmm. Right. So, in the face of this, in the face of an over-medicated population, in the face of a tragic future that probably ends in non-existence, in the face of a seemingly uncurable human propensity to sin and do evil, this is where I believe Christianity shines. Because we believe that what got released 2,000 years ago on that Sunday morning, well, it was, it was something that changed the world forever. It was hope for the weary, justice for the marginalized and the oppressed, meaning for the masses, grace for the sinner, and a future that lasts beyond death. What got released on that Sunday morning? Matthew 28, 1 tells us the story. Early on Sunday morning as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when looking for Jesus, or when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. 
And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet and worshiped. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Now, there are four things that Jesus says here to his disciples that I want to conclude with here briefly, all of which point us to the meaning of Easter. Uh, the first one is in 28, 9. It's the first thing the risen Jesus says to the women. It says, as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. Or translation, the first thing Jesus says to him is, hi. For real, every scholar I've read on this passage says the Greek word there, kairete, it actually is a standard word for an everyday greeting. Hey, how's it going? Uh, maybe we could translate it like this. And as they went, Jesus met them and said, sup? Talk about the understatement of the century, by the way. Sup? You're back from the dead. But this is a clue. The ordinariness of this greeting alongside the extraordinariness of the resurrection is the perfect way for the risen Jesus to introduce us to his new normal. From now on, resurrection life is the new normal. From now on, you can have spiritual power to defeat death and evil in your life. Eternal assurance in the face of death and evil in your life. From this day forward, he is risen and so shall we be. Uh, preacher Skip Vial tried to tell this, this story to a bunch of kids once in, in children's sermon. And he said, hey, Jesus greeted the women. Do you know what his first words were? And a little girl raised her hand and she said, I know. I know what Jesus' first words were. Ta-da! <laughs> and it's as good of a translation as any. Because think about how we see the cross 2,000 years later. What was once an expression of imminent death is now an expression of eternal hope. The cross, in a sense, has come to be understood as the exact opposite of its original intention. And now we know that cross-shaped love leads to resurrection life. This is the new normal. And Jesus says, ta-da! You know, in the eyes of some, Jesus squanders his young and promising life away. Yet to marry only 30 years old, hasn't even taken his show on the road yet. Think about how these miracles might hit in Rome. Yet the crowds are beginning to build. You see on Palm Sunday, Jesus rides into the greater Jerusalem metropolis, one of the burbs there, uh, on a donkey. And the people are waving palm branches, singing, Hosanna, blesses the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, to which the Pharisees are like, tell your followers to shut up. And Jesus is like, if they shut up, the rocks will cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Now, why though? Why are the, are the people singing and celebrating? Well, they see in Jesus messianic potential, real power. Have you heard of this man from Nazareth? Pfft, Nazareth, but it said he can multiply food. When he's king, we'll never go hungry again. Have you heard of this, this carpenter? He calms the storm, walks on water. He, he's healed the blind, healed the sick. He's even risen somebody from the dead. If he can do that, imagine what he can do to the Romans. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. You see, what a start to the week. But fast forward less than a week later, and many of these same people who were crying Hosanna are on Good Friday morning shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And crucify him they did. You know, I believe the modern politician uh, would look at Jesus and say, Jesus, huge loser. What a waste. 
He had the power, but he threw it away because it's all about power for them. But you see, Jesus was crucified without ever relinquishing an ounce of power. That's what you can't miss in the story. Read the last 24 hours of his life this week. What you'll see is that it's filled with supernatural tremors, electric shockwaves that point to the glory and the fury and the power still within him. At the Last Supper, John 13, it tells us that Jesus had a special knowledge of his power. He knew he was the most powerful man in the room, the most powerful man in the city of Jerusalem, the most powerful man on the face of the planet Earth. And yet what did he do with that power? He washed feet. Later, Judas shows up in the garden with Roman soldiers to arrest him. Could have been hundreds. Jesus is outmanned, outgunned, and they say, where is Jesus of Nazareth? And he steps forward and says the words, I am the name of God. And in John, it says when he says this, it's like an electric shockwave. The soldiers and Judas all fall down on the ground. You see, the same mouth that said, I am, the same voice that says, I am here is the same voice that that breathe life into existence in Genesis 1. So when he speaks, all fall down and they fall down. Jesus has the power, but then he hands himself over to be arrested. When they begin to arrest him, Peter pulls a sword, draws first and draws first blood. And Jesus says, I've got legions of angels just out of our sight that can come assist us. And we could end this battle right now in a moment. But does he? No, he says, put away your sword and heals the servant. Uh, Later, Jesus is standing before Pilate and Pilate's like, you better talk to me. I'm the only one who can save you. And Jesus says to him, save me. Pilate, the only reason you have any power at all over me is because it was given to you from above. And you see, what Pilate doesn't know is that Jesus is the king of the above. This is like the worst episode of Undercover Boss. Because Pilate is a hundred rungs removed from Jesus on the org chart and has no clue. And yet Jesus allows this hand servant of his to sentence him to death. He has power. And think about this, as Jesus hangs on the cross, even then he shows us his power. There's a criminal crucified next to him who begs for mercy, eternal mercy. And as Jesus is dying, He grants it, says you, me, paradise today. And boom, just like that, it's given unto him. As he dies on the cross, he's the adjudicator of souls. In one breath, he sets a man's eternal destiny. Oh yeah, and then in his last breath, he sets the rest of ours. So you see, Jesus wasn't caught off guard on Good Friday. He wasn't ambushed and drugged, kicking and screaming against his will to the cross no he chose it he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God the wages of sin was death it was a heavy debt there's a lot of sin in this room and in this world but whatever it cost Jesus had enough to pay because on Sunday morning he walked out free and now freedom is the new normal love is the new normal life is the new normal which is why I love what he says to to the ladies next he says do not be afraid Because see, this tracks, this tracks. Because if death is defeated, what's left to intimidate us, y'all? Nothing. Then after that, he tells the ladies, go gather the disciples and meet me in Galilee. And when they gather, Jesus gives them the great commission. Now I want you to notice, Jesus has risen, but his character has not changed. Same Jesus. Because he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I got the power. But then what does he do with the power? He gives it to us. He says, now you go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. And you can have that power today. It's called the great co-mission because it was Jesus' mission first and he's invited us in his mercy and grace to join in with him. Wow. By the way, no wonder so many of us are bored and unsatisfied with our lives. We're not on mission. There's a, a tyrant out there who is wreaking havoc on human community. He's taken our friends and our family as slaves to sin, destroying them. And he'll enslave them for a million lifetimes if you let him. And we're turning our brains off with Netflix? No, we got better news than that. We got the good news, great news, the best news there is. So how could it ever be an afterthought? Here's the thing, I don't actually believe you can live a bored life. You either are sad or you take that adventure that hunger for adventure inside you and you'll project it on something trivial. 
When we lower the stakes of the eternal, we raise the stakes of the here and now, right? So politics, romance, money, work, whatever. We look at these good things and we make them into ultimate things. But Jesus says, I got a better idea. Go and make disciples. And then he ends this way. He says, and surely I'll be with you always to the end of the age. Don't you love that promise? At the beginning of the, Ma- uh, of Ma- uh, of the gospel of Matthew, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. At the end of the gospel of Matthew, Jesus upgrades the promise and he's God with us always. All the way to the end, all the way till the dead are risen, all the way till justice is meted out and the world is made right, all the way until you and I are together forever. So the question today is this, uh, is that true? Is it true? I, I believe it is, but I can't make that decision for you. So if you're here today, and uh, I don't know, maybe you came reluctantly because grandma asked you to come or a pretty girl invited you and, and you're sitting here and you're like, that was maybe a better talk than I thought it would be, okay? Like, you're not gonna show it. Your arms are crossed, stoic. Don't let mom see that maybe this was okay, just stoic. But, but if on the inside, maybe there's a, a crack of interest or a bit of hope breaking through, I've got two invitations for you. One is this week, go home and read a gospel. Don't take my word on who Jesus is, take his word for it. But today, and the rest of our time, we're gonna sing three songs and take communion, that's it. And the rest of our time, I want you to pray in this service. God help me, Jesus I need help. I don't know what prayer you need to pray. I want you to pray. Maybe you're at a loss for words. Do you know what worship songs are? Prayers, song. So with the little mustard seed faith you have, lift up this song in faith to Jesus. And who knows, you may encounter Jesus today. He may come alive to you for the first time this week. Because here's what I believe, and many around you believe. He is risen, and indeed he is. That's what we believe. I hope you believe it before you leave today. Let's stand and sing. This is our opportunity to respond at any moment between now and the rest of service. If you want to come and pray and just let these songs uh, just be a prayer over you, we have these rugs here in front of the stage, and you have your time to come and pray as we sing together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength. My song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Were heights of love, were depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving seeks, my comforter.
have your communion. We have an opportunity this morning now to reflect and to remember. And Jesus gave us a very specific way that we get to remember him today. When he gathered with his disciples, he had supper, he uh, passed the bread around and he instructed each of them to take it. He said, this represents my body, it will be broken for each of you. Let's take the bread together. Similarly, he passed the cup around. He said, this represents my blood. It will be shed for each, and, for each and every one of you. Take it and remember me. Let's take it now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the body broken, the blood poured out. Thank you for the life that was lived, the life that was given, and the life we now receive through the cross. We remember. We look to you. We worship you today. Thank you for Jesus. It's his great name that we continue to sing and worship today.
Easter. I'm going to dismiss us in just a second and pray for us before we go. But I just want to remind you, if you are visiting with us, stop by our Welcome Center. Uh, we'd love to give you a gift. And if anybody wants to meet our new partner, uh, Refuge for Women, one of the representatives will be out there uh, to be able to answer questions for you. But I also want to invite you back next week as we start a brand new series from Roots to Branches, and it's about family relationships. Not necessarily a parenting series or a marriage series, but it's about all those relationships that are in our family. And I know that your family's perfect, but your spouse is, ooh, don't look at your spouse right now. That's bad. Don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, you did it. You're in trouble. All right. But hey, mommy, daddy issues, all those things that we all have to deal with. Not me, because my mom and dad are perfect. Thank you. Uh, but we, we have all these relationships that God can redeem and reconcile. And so we're going to talk about that. So you probably know somebody you should be bringing with you back to this series. We encourage you. Bring them along as, as we worship together. So let me pray, and then we'll go. Dear God, I thank you. I thank you for Easter. It's where we realize you are king, where you prove it. Every knee will bow in heaven and earth and below the earth, and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Lord, bring your kingdom here. May your kingdom come here in our city, here in our lives, God. May we love a little bit more uh, than we did on the way in here. May our faith be just a little bit stronger than it was when we walked in. And God, may that change our lives. May the way we believe and love you change our lives today. Thank you, God, for being so good. We thank you for that resurrection power in our lives. Help us to love each other and to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go love the Ville.
Satisfy my risk.